I'm getting increasingly embarrassed. I, uh, <laughs> um, and and I, I'm very honoured to have the opportunity of, uh, of addressing the colloquium. I think it's a it's a wonderful it's been a wonderful day to date, um, particularly just the, the richness and variety, but also the, uh, the overriding unity behind what's been presented. Um, I'm coming, uh, speaking of course, as an archbishop. My background, of course, is uh, is in in the church, so I have a natural theological bent to what I wish to offer this afternoon. So, so I, I come at um, this issue of, relig of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion um, from from that aspect. Um, I, I was a bit worried that um, Kevin was going to uh, take take all my thunder from me this afternoon in, in talking about um, butterflies. Kevin, really, <laughs> butterfly. But certainly there were two wings. It wasn't, uh, they didn't designate the creature that had them. Um, I, I would picture, I'd picture an eagle, is what I'm gonna say. Um, so I wanna talk about, uh, so my, the, my title is uh, The Two Wings, Faith and Reason, and I wanna talk about these in relation to their application to freedom of speech and, and freedom of religion. Because the intellectual tradition of um, Western civilization, which is obviously grounded in Christianity, um, is really grounded in the interplay between faith and, and reason. The faith here I'm speaking about, of course, is the, the Christian faith, um, which has um, profoundly shaped, formed uh, Western culture. When I talk about reason, thinking, um, in, in, to a large extent, we, we, we look at the development of philosophical thought, which has come into um, uh, uh, Western culture, but its, its origins, of course, are pre-Christian. We go back into um, particularly the Greek philosophers. So we can look at um, the faith, if you like, coming out of, um, out of the Holy Land, out of Israel. Um, we can look at um, reason coming out of Greece, if you like, in just very simple terms. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II, in his, um, uh, in his encyclical um, of 1998, entitled Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason, began by declaring Kevin, you're listening. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of the truth. I think it's a marvellous statement. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of the truth. Then he added, God has placed in the human heart a desire to know truth. And I think very important, clear, but very important statement, this desire, this search for truth. And of course, this is what we Christians have understood. We understand there is a truth, there is the truth, and the human heart searches and seeks out that truth. St Anselm of Canterbury described theology as fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. And he comments on this, um, this little statement by, by adding, I do not seek to understand in order that I might believe, but rather I believe in order that I might understand. In other words, faith precedes understanding. This is the basis of a set of theology, it's see, and indeed the basis upon which the Christian pursues truth. At the very heart of the truth is firstly faith, uh, the revelation of God, from, from God that comes to us via our faith and then we apply our reason, our intellectual capacity to pursue and, and understand it and, and to actually advance to a knowledge of truth. 
and with it wisdom. The encyclical Fides et Ratio argues for the importance of the discipline of philosophy, not only for the church, but for flourishing of, of human culture. So the Pope does spend a bit of time, and of course his background is actually in philosophy, so he spends a bit of time at the beginning of the encyclical speaking about how important um, philosophical thinking is and, and the disciplines associated with uh, philosophical thinking. Uh, and so he says, the importance of philosophical thought in the development of culture and its influence on patterns of personal and social behaviour is there for all to see. In addition, philosophy exercises a powerful, though not always obvious, influence on theology and its disciplines. It's kind of foundational, it's there underneath theological exercises. For these reasons, I've judged it appropriate and necessary to emphasise the value of theology, of philosophy, for the understanding of the faith, as well as the limits which philosophy faces when it neglects or rejects truths of revelation. The church, it says, remains profoundly convinced that faith and reason mutually support each other. So with that introduction, and I will return to it in the end, I want to now talk about the rise of ideology in contemporary society. And to argue very simply in this, uh, these few words that it stands in direct opposition to the tradition of the relationship of faith and reason which Pope St John Paul II sees as necessary for the true and sound development of culture and healthy patterns of human life. So let's begin by exploring what philosophy and is and what ideology is. Very simply, if we take the Greek roots of the word philosophy, philo, sophos, we could say very simply it is love of wisdom and the pursuit of truth. In other words, the philosopher looks at reality and seeks to understand it. Philosophy has an attitude of reverence towards reality and is open to being shaped by it. Philosophy is very simply, and we see this very much in its, in its origins from the Greeks, a search for the truth of things. Philosophy, while it seeks to understand reality, also recognises humbly that it cannot master all knowledge about reality. So philosophy is an ongoing process that never reaches its ultimate goal. In a talk in uh, 2005, uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, later of course to become Pope Benedict XVI, emphasised that faith and reason are not incompatible. And he argued, from the beginning, Christianity has understood itself as a religion of the Logos, as the religion, as the religion according to reason. So thus, in the mind of Cardinal Ratzinger, a person of faith has, has no problem with the use, use of rational thought because he describes Logos as creative reason and argues that the Christian is, is open to all that is truly rational. So we don't lock ourselves away in a faith component but we uh, compartment, but we uh, are open uh, to the exercise of, 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 uh, of the mind of, of reason. Now, by way of contrast, when we look at the word, uh, at ideology, I have to say that really ideology by its nature is actually the closing of the mind around a preconceived idea. Ideology arise at an idea which may be the result of a philosophical or scientific inquiry but then seeks to conform everything to this prevailing view of reality. So while philosophy will continue its search for truth, 
ideology will close itself to further questioning and will in fact reject everything that does not fit its view of reality. Philosophy realises that the world is complex and hard to understand. Its inquiry seeks to understand while at the same time being aware of limits. While on the other hand, in the face of the complexity of human reality, ideology develops a theory which explains everything and then it barricades itself around this idea. We are living in the age of ideology. One of the key reasons for the rise of ideology is in fact the demise of religion and the cultural patterns shaped by, by religion that have in the past provided meaning and value to human existence. However, our culture in the West is rapidly ab abandoning the element of faith as a constitutive element in human thought. Not accepting the contribution that faith makes, reason then is left to its own resources. And as our world has become more interconnected, as access to information has become more readily available, so as we all experience, the sheer complexity of the world bears in on us and bears in on, on society and does, I think, very rightly cause a heightened sense of uncertainty. And this fosters a, a yearning for some simple, all-encompassing idea on which one can hang one's own personal worldview. The 20th century witnessed the rise of two powerful ideologies, Nazism and Communism. Both as political ideas have proved to fail, while in the time of their ascendancy brought sufferings on millions of people. However, the Marxist ideology, which lay at the heart of communism, has morphed into, a new, into new cultural expressions, which at the present time are having a profound impact on Western culture. In particular, it is currently shaping society's view of gender, sexuality and race. This cultural Marxism lies at the heart of the rise of the woke movement, which has cap captivated not only the young, but even leaders of business and politics. And it's this that is driving social change in, in our society. The root of the notion of ideology is, is interesting in, the, in its linked to a, a group in the 19th century who, um, who called themselves the ideologues. And basically this movement um, proposed the idea of the, the scientific study of ideas. Now this is a movement that really came and went fairly simply. However, one person uh, got interested in the notion, uh, one Karl Marx, and he embraced the term. Marx concluded what he considered to be a scientific study of human history and human society. And his studies led him to the conclusion that human society is essentially grounded in a class struggle. His theory was not just about the struggle between the capitalist and the working classes, but became in his eyes an explanation of the whole of human existence, which has been revealed throughout human history. In other words, it was a total picture of reality. Thus he proposed what he believed as was a scientifically rational way to address this struggle. But he proposed in particular that there was a need to establish a new way to organise human society. So for Karl Marx, Philosophy was not an abstract process, but it was to be a philosophy of pure ideas. And these ideas would then drive political action. So while true philosophy will explore the human condition, 
ideology gives direction to a course of social and political action. A vital shift has taken place as the pursuit of truth is now replaced by the determination to act. And this action is essentially the will to have controlling power. Marxism's understanding of reality is shaped by a rigorous atheistic materialism. Ideology is driven by determination to change the current social system. Thus, for example, the distinction between truth and falsehood rests now not on any moral virtue, but simply on whether it advances the ideology or not. There's no longer, of course, any transcendental reality, and so there is no longer a need to search for or understand transcendental truth. So the idea is now uppermost and replaces the openness of the mind to find personal meaning and purpose. Marx, as we know, adopted a revolutionary standpoint. It's all about changing the world. Ideology is essentially, is, is essentially an abstract thought which considers itself complete within itself and so brooks no self-examination. It has simply to be acted upon. It has to change things which it sees as wrong. Ideology is the logic of an idea that is to be implemented at any cost. It assumes that its understanding of reality is sufficient to explain everything and therefore it must be realised. Its source of validation and power is the logical consistency of the idea and does not require an external validation from experience. Indeed, ideology lives to change reality to conform with its driving idea. So one result of this is the will to power so that society can be changed. Human freedom, even among those embracing the ideology, is denied because the idea is everything. Thus ideology is based on a simple preconception. For Marx it was that history is to be understood as a class struggle. For feminists, it is that feminine women's problems are the results of patriarchy. For those who determine that society is plagued by racism, it is due to white supremacy. For those who feel alienated, it is the ruling class of white males that are to blame. It reduces complexity to simple formulas. The ideological thinker organises all reality on the basis of some partial truth which is developed into a universal interpretation of reality. So how does this impact upon our subject of freedom of speech and freedom of religion? For a person driven by ideology, dialogue is impossible. The ideologue views all those who do not share their view of reality as the enemy. And so they naturally will adopt an antagonistic stance. And they readily classify people as belonging to certain categories and they view anyone who has a different view than their own as morally inferior. Those of a different view are seen as evil or oppressors. And ideology is, by its nature, oriented towards violence. Thus, in recent times, we've encountered the, the uh, cancel culture or deplatforming. During the marriage debate, for instance, threats were made against venues that were booked to present the no position. 
When a person dares espouse a contrary view, they are attacked, ridiculed and held down. They are not even allowed to speak. We've witnessed this especially through the use of social media, which has been used many, many times to viciously attack someone who dares to propose an alternative view. This is a radical intolerance of any idea which is contrary to their own. So in the light of the rise of ideology, we are experiencing a serious challenge to freedom of speech and freedom of religion in our country. It also means that the democratic political system which is built around the robust exchange of ideas can so easily become ossified. We cannot escape today, we just cannot escape the world of ideology, which is now such a powerful force in contemporary Western culture. In a, in a world that has chosen to relativise truth, this relativism, as Pope uh, Benedict says, as, as did as Cardinal Ratzinger, has said that this has become simply a dictatorship. Now it is the individual's view of reality that is uppermost. Those who have embraced a, a, an ideology, be it in relation to gender or sexuality or race or any other issue, are now so loud in their denunciation of their opponents and are determined to reshape society according to their ideology. They are absolute in their view and determined to impose it upon everyone. Thus, in the pursuit of their objectives, education is reduced to indoctrination. Society is being shaped by the force of these ideological positions. They've been able to coerce not only governments, but also corporations, sporting bodies and the media, such that decent men and women who sense that the ideological position is false are kowtowed into submission by the anger and violence of those who hold the ideological view. So how do we respond to this? I've put here immediately one has to say, not easily. Because <laughs> ultimately, the answer to ideology lies in the orientation of a person towards the transcendent. See, faith takes a person out of themselves. There is another to whom one looks. Meaning and purpose are found outside a driving idea. They're actually found in a relationship. They are found in the person of a loving and merciful God. They are experienced in a relationship which is simply the fruit of faith. And they are nourished by the freedom of choosing to live a life oriented towards someone who is greater than themselves. Pope Benedict said uh, in Deus Caritas Est, and I've quoted this quite a few times recently, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive, decisive direction. So it's true that only in such an encounter with the transcendent can people really be set free from the clutch of an idea. Secondly, 
ideology will be overcome by people who adhere to the belief that there is truth, objective and enduring truth. And while we cannot argue with the ideologue, it's still possible for each one of us to be a humble witness to truth. When we are alert to the dangers of ideological positions on social questions, we take the simple decision to adhere to the pursuit of truth, living by one's personal beliefs and being armed by a good dose of common sense. A humble belief in truth can be very disarming to the ideologue. But Jesus taught us, didn't he? It's the truth that will set you free. So it will be, it must be, and can only be, the interplay between faith and reason that will ultimately provide an antidote to ideology. Thank you.